RBC, the voice of the voiceless. Welcome to another episode of Straight No Chaser. Unfiltered. A grassroots community talk medium designed to be a voice of the voiceless. Featuring various community members' opinions on spirituality, history, social organization, economic organization, political organization, creative production, and community ethos. Straight No Chaser Unfiltered is produced by the Royal Broadcasting Company, RBC, the voice of the voiceless, Straight No Chaser Unfiltered. And now, here's the host of Straight No Chaser Unfiltered, Gloria Winston. Good afternoon. I'm so pleased to welcome back our listening audience to Straight No Chaser Unfiltered. And today's guest, one of my favorite, favorite people, Tracy L. Williams. And if you don't know who he is, you will soon find out. I can't even begin. I'll take the, the, the time of the whole show to try to describe who he is and what he does, because he has his hands in so many things, from being an entrepreneur, an author, he has horses, he writes books, he owns real estate, and he conducts seminars. But the big thing he's getting ready to do, he's going to ride his bicycle from Los Angeles to New York City very soon. But I'll let him tell you more about that. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Of course. You said unfiltered. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. <laughs> unfiltered. I call, I call it the unfiltered part. All right. All right. So tell us about the ride first that you're taking and why you're doing it. Well, I decided to do the ride from... LA to New York to start a foundation. In 2002, my first wife died. Um, and when she died, we had just got into buying properties and we realized that there wasn't a lot of black people in this business. So whenever we needed an engineer, we needed a lawyer, wasn't no, wasn't no black people to, to help us out. So when she passed away, she was taking the LSAT so that she can get into corporate law and she wanted to represent businesses and do civil stuff with them. Um, so unfortunately, it took a lot a lot of years uh, for my children to get older and for them to want to be a part of it. And so I'm doing my very first fundraiser riding across the country. Uh, so it's a great accomplishment for a great foundation. Great. So that's what we're raising money for, to get scholarships for um, minorities to focus in. Law, tax law, urban development, um, um, civil engineering, architect, anything that has to do with rebuilding cities. Because too often, when you go to do something in the cities, it's always white people or other people that are controlling re, uh, re, um, renovating our cities. So I'm, how, how is it possible that the minority is trying to remodel or redevelop the inner cities where the minorities live in? You can't replicate that culture. And part of culture is in, in your remodeling, so that has to be a part of your blueprint. And I don't think they got our culture, so we need people that is from where we at. And so when they design some stuff, they don't forget our culture, too. All right. So now tell me about the seminars that you give periodically, I think two or three times a year, Yep. the workshops. We try and do them quarterly. Um, last year we did four. Yeah, last year we did four. This year we're going to probably only do two because of this ride and building up the foundation. But it's called the Wealth and Real Estate Seminar. And we do that so, again, that minorities can begin buying the areas in, in which they live in. The thing is that with the Wealth and Real Estate Seminar, it's not just about real estate, though. It's a group of landlords that when you buy something, I make a commitment to you that I'm going to be a good landlord, right, so that we can make sure that we improve the areas that we live in, make sure everything looks nice. Um, we want to stay grassroots, make a civilian. We want to make sure that we stay politically active make sure that we engage in neighborhood organizations, neighborhood business organizations. Mm -hmm. They can tell us what they require from uh, the people that live in those neighborhoods or operate in those neighborhoods. We can tell them what we need. Uh, we can talk to our tenants firsthand, right? So we're like a liaison between these other agencies and our tenants. So if we have a bunch of landlords and all of our tenants have children, we want a playground or something in this neighborhood. Uh, we want to bring back some community gardens or we want to bring back block parties or it's something that get these people back outside talking to each other because once people begin talking to each other and um, becoming active then some other things happen because if you're my neighbor and I know you and there's somebody in your yard I'm gonna let you know mm -hmm. but if I don't know you I don't care who you are. 
<laughs> that's that's what we've evolved into. We right. don't talk to each other anymore at all. And social media doesn't make it any better. Sure doesn't. Yeah. So as landlords, we said that um, if I got ten houses on one street and you got ten houses on that same street, then we will conduct the come out and get to know your neighbors thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be waiting for a tenant to do it, or we'll work with the other tenant associations, or landlord associations, or neighborhood associations to try and do things like that from the civilian point. So now, one of the things that's evolved from your seminars is landlord group, right? Yep. You have a landlord-tenant group? Or yep. Could you Rochester tell us more about group. that? Tell us about it. Originally, um, the landlord group, we were, Kirk and I, we were going to start that in five years, right? We wanted to do five years' worth of seminars, see which people actually took the seminar and applied those things uh, and take the best landlords out of them and form this investment group. And from the investment group, those people, then we would uh, pool our money together to open up franchises together. Things that we need in our community. Mm -hmm. So we can open up franchises or we can do the bigger purchases together, uh, like the Pikes, like the con like other companies. Mm -hmm. So we, uh, th th that's the plan. All right. And it's going very, very, very good so far. I didn't think, in year three, we ended up doing that as opposed to year five because a lot of people were interested in the overall health of the neighborhoods and making sure that we own where we live. That's beautiful, that's so. beautiful. Now I'm assuming that you, of course, have the support of the city in, we, in what we do. you're doing? Good. We do. Very good. Um, well, let me re we got the support of the people we need to have support from. Okay, so I got you. I'll say that the administration that's in place right now made this very possible because they have the people's interests in mind. Um, mm -hmm. They open up doors, they're accessing information. I've been doing real estate a long time, and so I go down there and I'd ask for some information and all the red tape and all the hoopla. Mm -hmm. You said you, you said uncensored almost. I, I almost was just uncensored, <laughs> but all the stuff that you had to go to in order to get it, you don't make man forget it, right? So I just mm -hmm. keep doing it the way I've been doing it. Mm -hmm. No support from downtown whatsoever. And now when you go down there, it's nice to know that you have a friend. So if I'm at that front desk and someone at that front desk gives me a problem, I don't even let them know. I know I, I know your boss. So <laughs> I just leave and I make a phone call, then I come right back with the same paperwork and mm -hmm. we have, now we have access. And then we get the right information, the way we're supposed to fill out the paperwork, um, what, you know, the, the steps it has to go to. And mm -hmm. Without that information, you can't really do much. You just get frustrated. And that's why I think that's why for years a lot of people stayed out of even attempting to open a business or even attempting to do any type of major development. They made it almost impossible. Now you have a publishing company also? I do. Could you the, tell us more about that? WGW Publishing. And you know, everything I do is centered around a positive message. So uh, Dr. Wanda Gibbs and I, we decided to start a publishing company. And the only thing, only titles that we take are books that have positive messages. Mm -hmm. Only books we take are things that uh, project positive images for black people. We are looking for more people with history so we can tell their stories. Mm -hmm. um, local people with um, rich histories, we're looking for more people, professional people so they can say what they do. I'm getting tired of the, you know, the story where if someone does something good that's black, is, oh, we're so proud of you, you did it. Success is normal for us. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why they're starting to paint it as something different. Every, I'm around you. When me and you begin to talk, I'm around the Dr. Brocks and the, the, the Sean Nelms and the, the mayor, and I'm around every, every, everywhere I look, I see success. So I'm not sure if someone is unsuccessful, that's when we shot. So I don't know why they've been painting this narrative where if you made it from a certain place, it's, it's this big, oh, you made it. Nah, we smart, we been smart. I don't know, I don't know this narrative that they're telling. So now we just wanna make sure that we get a lot of people to write books and tell their stories, and we wanna give them the platform to tell their stories. So if they have a story that they wanna tell, that's positive. Mm -hmm. um, we want to publish it and we want to get it out there. That's another reason why I'm writing across the country so I can talk about the many books that we have, the many books that I've written. I know you told me to bring my books and I, I apologize yes, I don't yes. have the, the well, physical copies. Since you don't have them, you can tell us about each one of them. Because I'm, I'm curious as to where you find the energy to write books. You've written seven in two or three years, right? Yes. Well, the, actually, the first one I, I released was in 2012 and I was just uh, getting used to writing in that format. I've always journaled, you know, I've always tried to keep track of my emotions and stuff like that, I've always journaled, but in book form, I felt, because I was a bad kid, 
let me rephrase. I was active. I was active in places I shouldn't have been active. <laughs> That's it. I ain't going to say bad. Right? All right. I was, I was active in some areas I shouldn't have been active in. So as I got older and I began to understand the system and the process of the system, I wanted to write a book that can tell uh, young men from their, from their vantage point. I actually had to go back. I had to take myself back to a time when I was 12 and 13 and write from that point. The problem that I find with a lot of people once they get educated or you know they get all them alphabet after their name when they begin to write they're writing at the person or they begin to write for their constituents as opposed to the people that they want to reach so if i'm writing a book i'm talking about where i came from but i'm trying to impress you because you have a doctorate degree or something like that or a doctorate and so i'm writing these books and i'm like hey look at this book i wrote mm -hmm. but in reality i'm just trying to impress my constituents, ooh, I wrote a book. So um, most of my books are written in a way that a 13-year-old would understand it. So I went back and I told my story from that vantage point and it's well received from the people that I meant to get the message to. And so after I finished that book, it was called The Come Up For Boys. It was just called The Come Up, that was just it. Because mm -hmm. you got some information, I'm like, man, listen, you know, you know what you always say? If I knew then what I, I know, know now. Mm -hmm. So I tell them like, I got to come up. I got, I got some information for you. You use this, you're going to be all right. Like if you walk across the town and you, or you walk across any place and you want to cross a, a bag with a bunch of money, that's a come up. You got some free information, mm -hmm. right? You got some information that's going to help you out. Um, so after I released that book successfully and I was in a city school district and um, I was in a rec centers, I realized that some of my parents needed something to read too. So. <laughs> Say it loud, because so, that's part of the problem. Right. Say it again. So the, the parents needed a book. <laughs> um, so I wrote a book called The Come Up for Men. I can only write from a man's perspective. Um, and in there I talked about uh, some of the fallacies of manhood that we thought was manly, right? Um, because of some of these misconceptions, I believe I missed out on a lot, right? And so one of the examples I like to give is when us men are sitting there looking for respect for other men, we're disrespecting our women. Mm -hmm. So there will be times, you, you know, you might have someone in your life that you really love, but if you don't have the respect of your homeboy or your friends, then they look at you differently and now you're feeling some type of way, so now you go out there and you might talk to somebody you don't really want to. You're jeopardizing a whole lot. And anyway, I, I, we can spend the whole show talking about that. So I just wrote the the idea or some of the stuff that we were taught for manhood is not really masculine at all. Right? It's it's matter of fact it's anti masculine and it's been tearing away the fabric of the family for a long time. So that book is about addressing some of those issues, having conversations. Mm -hmm. Um because when I wrote the come up for boys I interviewed a lot of my friends. I was in a gang, I was a G boy. And the amazing thing is, whenever I was able to get one of my friends alone, mm -hmm. right, just, mm -hmm. just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, half the stuff that we was doing, we didn't feel like doing, mm -hmm. right? And then that same person who we almost had a cry-on-your-shoulder moment about, man, listen, I really like this, or I wanted to do this, and I got caught up in this, and I'm like, man, I didn't want to do it either, right? Mm -hmm. And then that same person, though, mind you, we'll meet up at some bar, and now all of our friends are together, and we're talking about that same old stuff. I'm like, you just said that. <laughs> I don't I'm confused, right? So that group think thing. So we got to try and find a way to dismantle some of that. Right. So that was the come up for men. Um, then I wrote Urban Development, which was a novel. And those were the people that wouldn't read that book. So I tried to reinvent Nino Brown. We needed a, we needed a new criminal that had the morals and integrity. You know, mm -hmm. most of the times when people think of successful Gangsters, they look at the Godfather or something like that, right? That has all of those different virtues and values in it, family, respect. So I wanted to reinvent the common villain mm -hmm. that would make some of the stuff that was prevalent in um, African-American gangster moves un uncool, right? So you can do all of this stuff, but just do it differently. Something to get their attention, at least, right? right? So they can be like, man, don't do that, don't do that this way. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be gangsters. We're going to be the smoothest gangsters ever. We're going to stop destroying our community. We're going to get all the money, but we're going to be low with it, right? Mm -hmm. Th those type of things. Um, so that's why I wrote the um, Urban Development, Adapt or Die. The sequel is coming out too. So. And I often wondered after reading it, was that a was that pattern on your life by that, any chance? No, nah, that was, that was uh, <laughs> how, how do I want to say it? 
that was my imagined life. I wish. Oh, okay. Okay. Right? I wish it was that mm -hmm. smooth and that easy. Because mm -hmm. the main character, you know, he was about his family. He really loved right. his wife. Um, right. his, well, his girlfriend in the book. Had a wonderful relationship with his mother. Um, trying to tell all his friends, hey, listen, we're going you know, to do this different. So basically, it was a... Uh, it was it was a it was a made up me. I wish I was that smooth. All right. So, so then you changed your direction and you're writing children's books now. Yes. Tell us about those. When, as I got into that stuff, right, things just start to come to you. Um, and so, I said, well, I got the the young men covered. I got the men covered. I got the thugs covered. I think, right. So, how come? when we begin to have certain conversations or when I wanted to introduce something to the uh, Rochester City School District that talked about finance and income gap and education gap and all of these things that they should know. Um, they're like, well, it's not age appropriate. I'm like, how can it not be age appropriate? Because there are other groups of people out there mm -hmm. whose children get this just in everyday living. It's their externalities, right? They have these externalities that allow them to pick up um, verbiage and language and other things that teach that from them just being alive. Right. Right. And so, if there's a set of parents that don't know about that, then their kids won't be able to pick up on that. They won't hear it when they're going outside and playing. And if you're aware of your community, especially if your your school system serves this population, mm -hmm. um, and you know that some information is missing, that that information gap then I would think that you would include that in your curriculum. Right. Um, and so I guess it's under the idea that, okay, well, we're supposed to teach this, right? This is what the school teaches. Mm -hmm. This is what we teach out there as well, right? So the curriculum um, may not be that different and certain things they should get from home. Well, that, that's not, it's not the same. We, we're in two different sets of areas and if you are going to be in this area teaching, Mm -hmm. then I would think that you would be able to say, okay, well, there's some stuff that they're getting out there naturally that's not, that's really important for life, mm -hmm. that they're not giving in the city. And if we want to balance this out, right, we keep talking about the economic gap and the education gap, then if we want to level the playing field, then the same information that they're getting outside of school, mm -hmm. we should probably put in school because the stuff that they're getting outside of school is the same thing that they're still interviewing on. Right. Mm -hmm. It's some language and stuff that's out there that we don't necessarily teach. But if you're in it all the time, then this is going to become natural for you. Mm -hmm. um, so when we begin to talk about that type of stuff, for me, at least once I, once I call on to the trick, mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't waste a whole lot of time complaining about the SATs and saying they're culturally biased and this. I'm like, well, they got this book out here at Barnes & Nobles, right? Mm -hmm. So they're giving us, I know the rules. And this is the same fight that was happening when I was little. And even though I could still fight against it because it's culturally biased, well, the answers is out here still. And mm -hmm. if I got to participate in this system, I gave my kids the SAT books when they was in sixth grade. All right. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we know the test ain't going nowhere yet. Um, I could still fight that fight, but if they got to take it, mm -hmm. I might as well prepare them for it. Right. If that makes sense. I go off on a tangent. No, Sometimes you got to bring me back. <laughs> no. You got to bring me back, Gloria, because I've talked about fine. this forever. You, please, that's why you're here. All right. So those, <laughs> those type of things, and even with the Wealth and Real Estate course, is we talk about real estate as the vessel mm -hmm. um, to start achieving real estate. That's the start. Buying real estate is the easiest part. Mm -hmm. Keeping real estate is the hardest part. And then accumulating wealth. How do you balance this money? What do you do with it? Do you get life insurance? You know, the diff like today, Will Hall came in and he talked about the difference between term and uh, whole life. Uh, he talked about other different ways that people can use their whole life, cashing out, becoming your own bank. So many different ways that we can um, keep wealth. Mm -hmm. So when the Wealth and Real Estate Seminar is not just about buying real estate. So when people hear that, they're like Wealth and Real Estate. And the very first class they come into all they hear is about a vision board. They don't hear about real estate until they third class. They're like, what did I just sign up for? I thought you said this was a real estate seminar. Mm -hmm. I said, no, this is wealth class. All right. Using real estate as a vessel. And that, that can be your platform because that's what I know. Mm -hmm. And you may get your money some other kind of way, but you still need that wealth part. Right. Not rich as well. Cause it's Big difference. The huge. Right. Huge. So what was the name of your first children's book? The first children's book was Millionaire Marvin. 
Oh, really? <laughs> we talk, and in there, I talked about the income gap mm -hmm. and the education gap. Mm -hmm. Everything that they said wasn't age appropriate. Well, I said it's going to be age appropriate because I'm writing. Mm -hmm. um, and in that book, um, Marvin has a good relationship with his grandparents, so he asks his father in the book, what's the income gap? What's the education gap? And so the grandfather explains it to him. The little boy is like, well, I'm closing it, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So he goes out and he um, starts a, ma a plane manufacturing company. He wants to be an engineer, so he makes the best planes possible, and he goes to school, and he's showing all the other kids. He's a black kid in a diverse school, right? Mm -hmm. And so this black kid is selling all that good engineering to other kids. Mm -hmm. right? But it's the black kid that's selling the stuff to all other the mm -hmm. Asians and the all right. white, you know, usually that's reverse for us, right? The, right. Main, the main character is the white kid doing all the stuff for the black kids. Right. And this one, we, we, I reverse it in all my books, is the main character is Marvin. And then you know, his parents, his grandparents tell him how to go out and shovel through the driveways, uh, rake some leaves, do some groceries, get some stuff, and begin to plan and organize your money, match that with your grades so you can become successful mm -hmm. and close that income and education gap. So in the end of the book, he, He's sitting there with his grandparents, and his grades just went up, and so did the money in his bank. All right. All right. So, No, that wasn't my first one. Why you let me tell that? Well, you're telling it. My first book was <laughs> Eagles Belong in the Sky. All right. Well, and this you is let true. me. Well, you're telling your story the way you want to tell it. I know there were four books. Right. You name them like you wanted to name them. That one was important. We were talking about money. Mm -hmm. So we, a Millionaire Marvin came to mind. All right. Eagles Belong in the Sky. Mm -hmm. The one that I asked you to read and edit and give me some feedback on. Right. I remember. Yep. And so that book is just about the lies that get told from generation to generation. And they confuse that with love. Right. Um, and I just want people to be aware that people can love you and still do harm for you, even though they don't mean it. So with eagles belong in the sky, um, there's an eagle that was around a bunch of chickens. And he sees some other eagles and he's like, oh, okay, I can do this. But then the, the chickens are like, man. You are the you the best down here up there. You're just gonna be a regular old eagle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're the man down here. So the rooster, con, the little con rooster is like, mm -hmm. go give him some hugs. Tell him you love him. Right? Uh -huh. Tell him that we need him. Right? Show him that we can't go up on that fence, but he can get up on that fence. So he's like, I can jump the highest down here. The other eagle's like, you belong up here though. You know how much higher that is. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the thing where people can sometimes use love to hold you captive. They don't mean any harm by it, right? They don't necessarily want to see you do bad. Like, my uncles loved me, all of them. They loved me dearly. I was one of the favorite nephews, right? Mm -hmm. I was popular. Mm -hmm. So they offered me alcohol, telling me about women, and, you know, we having a good time laughing. They loving me. I'm loving them. And I'm like, wait a minute. All this stuff y'all loving and teaching me, that's kind of hurting me too, though. Mm -hmm. So th those type of things. And that was the one with the uh, eagles blowing in the sky. Mm -hmm. And to be, be very careful of that. You can love somebody, but you don't necessarily have to be captive by their love. Right, right. So. Yeah, I really enjoyed that book. I enjoyed watching the struggle. You know, the eagles trying to convince him, you belong with us. But the chicken saying, you know, like the old parable, but you belong here on the ground with us. You right. Know, you were raised to believe you're a chicken. And they really, but it, it, it really was relating to life. Right. Because we all have those friends, mm -hmm. you know, that want to see us do better, so they say. Right. <laughs> right. But the minute you try to step, they're the first ones holding you back. Right. So tell us about the other two children's books. The other one is um, Marvin's Garden, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm an avid gardener, so that one was an easy write for me. And in that book, the grandfather teaches him the importance of saving your pennies, but we use it in a different way. And watch out for those mooching friends. So <laughs> that, that, that's the story. Uh, mm -hmm. He wants to, he watches his grandfather for all those years and he can't wait to plant, right? He loves gardening. So his grandfather finally gives him a little plot of land that he can work on and he plants and he grows all the, all this good stuff, right? He starts to, the fruit comes in and he takes it to school. He's like, hey, look, I grew all of this and they eating up all that good food. Mm -hmm. And you know, the harvest is gonna be over pretty soon. There's gonna be a drought at some point. And if you don't save your money, or if you don't plan for your droughts, then it's gonna be a problem. And so now all of his food is gone. He's going back to school. He doesn't have anything for his lunch and he's asking his friends for something. They're like, nah, we ain't got it. But he's like, well, I just emptied my whole wallet my whole field i gave to you and you i can't get nothing mm -hmm. so they're like no nah, we ain't got it 
So he goes back to his uh, grandfather. One, they, they, they stop talking to him because he don't have anything to give anymore. Mm -hmm. And two, he's hungry, so he asks his grandfather, well, granddad, can I, um, can I get some stuff out of your garden so I can take to school so I can have friends again? Grandfather, like, nah. <laughs> if you remember, I told you to save some of your fruit because mm -hmm. there's going to come a time when you're going to need it. Um, I told you to save some seeds so you can plant next year. Mm -hmm. You took everything. You even destroyed the seeds that I gave you. So then he gave him another opportunity and he um, gave him some seeds and said, next year I'm going to set apart another spot for you on the barn mm -hmm. where you can save your best seeds so that you can have something for the future. So uh, this, the, ba the overall storyline in that one is don't give all your stuff away and save for the future. Right. <laughs> right. Watch out for the moochers. That's a great lesson. And so. it takes some of us a lifetime to learn it. Right. You know, right. especially the good people. Right. You know, because we're taught from the time we were little, you know, what a blessing it is to be able to give. Mm -hmm. But the older you get, I think you realize everybody doesn't appreciate the gift. Right. 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 And so the last one is Healthy Marvin, and that's the one that's going to be released soon. And that's just about um, overall health. And so the same thing happens with uh, his grandparents. And the grandparents end up having a, uh, they, they one of the friends call from the family, and they're, they're talking about health problems that they got as they get older. And Marvin is asking them, well, you know, what's this disease and what's that disease? And the grandfather ends up telling him about cholesterol and strokes and stuff like that and things that he, sh he needs to do to be healthy. So now Marvin goes out and he's exercising, he's racing in school. Um, when he determined to be healthy. And wow. then he wants his grandparents to participate so they'll be around for a while too. So that's, those are the lessons that we teach in the books. Well, hopefully the administration in the city school district is paying attention. Uh, I think of all the books that they do buy mm -hmm. that are not culturally sensitive to us. So right. I'll be there advocating for you. You, you know? always have been. <laughs> it just makes sense. Right. You know. Um, but anyway, are you still racing horses? I sold all my horses last year. Okay. But I'm buying more. All right. Um, I, I needed to get a different team. Um, I'm not sure how many people actually know about horse racing, but I, um, when I got into horse racing, I got in with a, uh, he was a good person, right? But mm -hmm. we had a, um, we had a relationship where I would buy the horses and I would pay the vet bills and he'd buy the feed and do all the, you know, uptake, uh, mm -hmm. all the take care of them and then we'd split the, split the winnings. And he did very good. My very first race, I came in first place. It was a nice check. I right? remember. That was at Finger Lakes, right? Finger Lakes. Yeah. Very first race. First place. Jerry mm -hmm. with a G. All right. And so I got all my money back in one race, enough for two years, as, right. you know, as far as the cost of running the horses. But what he was doing was he would run the horses often and that's not healthy for the horses right um but i understood why he was doing it even though i didn't agree and because i fell in love with animals i realized that um that's you, you can't run a horse mm -hmm. every seven to 14 days they need a, a rest period mm -hmm. um, but because the cost of um, feeding a horse and taking care of a horse is pretty high he needed to run them but because i learned the sport and i fell in love with the sport i did find someone because uh, i had some horses down in miami mm -hmm. at Gulfstream. So I found a good trainer down there, and now we're looking at buying more horses. But I just wanted to sell my stake in those horses because I care about the, the health of the horse. Mm -hmm. And there's some things I learned along the way. Um, again, I was a novice, and so some of the horses, they would get sick. And so I would talk to the vet, and the vet would pull me to the side about this particular trainer and say, well, he runs his horses too much. Mm -hmm. And um, there was something wrong with two of the uh, horse's livers. And he said, well, when you overexert yourself like that, it puts a strain on the liver, especially for a horse. So I was like, okay, well, we need to slow down the amount that we raised some more, we needed to do something different. Um, mm -hmm. So I decided to find a different trainer. But I'm definitely going back to it. I love but it. But you were racing in Florida too, right? Yep, Florida, Virginia, Ohio. All right, all right. And so he, but it was, it was with the same trainer. So mm -hmm. he had trainers in different areas. So right. um, I was racing in four different states, going to Ohio, I went to Virginia, Miami was the best, Gulf Stream is beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's a whole new life down there. Well, nobody can ever accuse you of not living your best life, Tracy. Living my best life. Now, most people, hopefully, I'm, I'm, I'm sure most people realize you own the Charleston house. Yes. You ran into technical difficulties or whatever. But I'm sure you get the question, when is it coming back? Because I know those Charleston wings are missed by people, especially like me. 
Are you planning to reopen a restaurant at some point? Absolutely. I've been looking nonstop since we closed. But the Charleston House was a very special place. You got to remember, we remodeled that mm -hmm. entire space to make it what it was. Um, and so when I go look at these other areas, I won't make the same mistake. I got to own the building. To oh. dump that amount of money and remodeling someone else's spot, um, I won't be doing that again. So I have to own the building. The ambiance has to be. Charleston House was a special place. Right. And I looked at 50 places and it just doesn't foot the bill. Mm -hmm. So when I deliver the Charleston House to the Rochester community again, it's going to be the same quality, except better. Same ambiance, uh, better customer service, everything. I, I fell in love with the Charleston House. So you and if, me both. <laughs> right. <laughs> if it if if the if the building wasn't in disrepair, mm -hmm. um, remember the roof fell in. Yeah, uh, I remember it, you had a lot of problems. A lot of problems. It was leaking over the bar. Mm -hmm. um, the air condition stopped working. Just just a bunch of things in that particular unit um, that made it uncomfortable for the customers. And I can understand you want a good dining experience when you come. Um, and sometimes when they came in, we couldn't give them the best dining. Uh, service. Mm -hmm. um, some of that, most of that was out of our control. Mm -hmm. and because it was a special pace, I'm looking at, I've even um, began talking to people that have, you know, higher end restaurants. Mm -hmm. Through being in Miami with horse racing, I've met some pretty good people. All right. So they've been telling me the proper way to fund it, to finance it, how to set it up, how to do it the right way so that Rochester can have a wonderful dining experience when we do open back up. Right. So. Well, I know it's missed. And my, you know, not only because of the ambiance, but I just appreciated somewhere adults could go. Because mm -hmm. these young people stop me from going anywhere. Right. You know, you don't know how they're going to act. Right. Particularly where there's liquor. Well, you didn't sell liquor. You sold beer and wine. On purpose. Oh, oh yeah. And that, and <laughs> you could sense the atmosphere, how it contributed to the atmosphere. You didn't have to deal with a whole lot of drunks. Right. You know. <laughs> That's the bottom line because, you know, I bartended for years. Right. But as a senior citizen now, wherever I go, I want to be able to just relax. Right. So that was very much appreciated, along with the jazz that you were bringing in. Absolutely. I yeah. enjoyed it. One block at a time. One at a time. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, Tracy, I want to thank you for taking time from your busy, busy schedule because there's no one that can't say you're not busy. <laughs> and... Uh, we look forward to having you back at some point, especially after your ride. Now, when exactly are you taking the ride from California to New York? I leave Rochester on March 27th. I start riding my bike from L.A. March 29th. I'm stopping in 13 different states. Uh, I'm a Mason, and so I'll be stopping in every Grand Lodge in those 13 states. And in those mm -hmm. 13 states, I'm going to be meeting with local politicians, local organizations, and local um, community leaders mm -hmm. to begin to see if we can start having a dialogue or a way to communicate where we can have a common message, right? And mm -hmm. hopefully when I get back, those 13 states will be the first states that we talk to and we begin to open up some communications. They'll say, okay, we are going to have this one common thread that we're going to do in every community. So with the CTW Foundation, what we want to do is like, suppose you have an organization that you work with young ladies, right? Mm -hmm. And um, NOMA, the National Association of Minority Architects, I say, well, you can apply to the CTW and we will give you the $5,000 needed to start your program um, to team up with NOMA so that these kids at a very young age can know about civil engineering. They can know about uh, becoming an architect. They can know about urban planning and urban economics and how a city functions and everything that the amenities that need to be there in order to make a community uh, healthy, productive, fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the live, work, play area. So as we begin to teach kids all of these things that are needed in the neighborhood and why they're needed and why they should participate in it. Mm -hmm. And so the second thing that we do with the CTW Foundation is for graduate, graduating seniors that want to enter in some of those fields that are centered around uh, urban renewal, we'll mm -hmm. give the graduating senior um, a full scholarship. Wow. So that's why I want, that's why I need to raise so much money because I'm riding from LA to New York for that purpose. That's the thing that we're trying to attack. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I want to thank you once again for your time. Absolutely. And I'll be praying for you on that bicycle all the way back to New York. I'll be live every day, and video and blogging and blogging. Look forward to an invitation back. Um, I want to close this out right now. And in case I forgot, because I think I did in the beginning of the show, to mention my name is Gloria Winston. But again, you're watching Straight, No Chaser, Unfiltered. And once again, Tracy L. Williams, 
um, has dropped lots of knowledge. I hope some of you were really listening and pay attention. Have a good evening. RBC, the voice of the voiceless. Welcome to another episode of Straight No Chaser. Unfiltered, a grassroots community talk medium designed